Okay, it's uh, seven o'clock, so we'll start this meeting of the uh, Kenmore Planning Commission. The first item of business is citizen comments, and don't think there are any other attendees on the line, but if there are, they're welcome to share any comments they may have for us. We have no attendees at this time. Okay. So we'll move on to the next item, which is um, approval of the minutes. We have um, two different mini, uh, meeting minutes to, um, to approve July 7th and July 21st. So why don't, we do, uh, why don't we do one at a time and have a motion on the July 7th uh, Planning Commission meeting minutes. I move we approve the July 7th planning committee meeting minutes. I uh, could, couldn't hear. Was there a second? Yes, this is Mike. I okay, second. great. Okay, any discussion on those particular minutes from July 7th? I had a, a couple of questions. Um, one is a matter of protocol is that do we list the commissioners? without their title. I, I found that it was a couple of places we did that. And I didn't know whether we should amend that or ask more or what she, how she wants to handle that. Dennis, do you mean do you mean in the um, in the roll call of the roster or in the actual text of the um, the, the text the of the minutes. The text of the minutes. Uh-huh. Um, Maura, do you, or what's, what is the protocol for that? Is there, or is there a protocol for, for that? To my knowledge, there's no particular protocol on that. I'm happy to include, um, or change the way we reference commissioners, if that's something we would like to do. Okay. I just think it should be consistent. That's all. And just by way of example, on the July 7th minutes, page two, I'm noted as seconding um, by both my names rather than as commissioner. And then on the next page, um, the second is by Carol Baker rather than Commissioner Baker. Mm -hmm. And then you'll find that when we go to the uh, July 21 minutes, um, Carol referred to as Commissioner Baker when she seconds the motion. So I just looking for consistency. I've made a note of that and I will um, begin ensuring consistency in how commissioners are referenced. Okay. Um, can we do that for, for this particular minutes, um, Maura, with, with approval and with the, the changes um, as Commissioner Olson outlined? Sure, to go back and um, if approved tonight, go back and change to create consistency. Is that the request? I think so, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I don't think we need a, a you know a formal amendment to the to the motion. Just an understanding that 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 will be um, revised in the in the final um, meeting minutes. So any more discussion on on the July seventh um, minutes? The, I do have a couple more sure. on the July seventh. The last sentence in paragraph four agenda items. Um, it seems like it's incomplete. The hope is to bring this project forward to the planning commission next. Is that really at the next meeting or is that just another way of writing? Um, well, the, the way I read it is just that it, it, it looks like the hope, uh, again, the hope is to bring this project from the city council and next to the planning commission, I guess it might be uh, rewarded if you're if you don't think it's clear, Commissioner Olson. Would you like to do that? Yeah, just a second.
I guess after I would put next after the word forward, if that's the way we're reading it. Okay. I'm happy to make that change. I was um, in the process of managing um, promoting panelists. Can you restate what page number that was on? Um, <laughs> this is July seven minutes. Okay. It's at the near the bottom of the page, that first page, and it's uh, under paragraph four agenda items. So it would be it would read. The hope is to bring this project forward next to the Planning Commission. Then maybe, yeah. I'm making a note, just one moment. Um, and was there something else? The um, yes. <clears throat> on page three of the July seven minutes, um, the last full paragraph, um, the second sentence, it said, there was a question on how the amount of creating this off leash area was calculated. And I think the amount was really the cost of creating, at least that's what's confirmed in the next set of minutes. Because when I read it, I wasn't sure whether the question was on the cost or the square foot size, but being answered in the next set of minutes, it's talking about the cost. So I just wanted to be clarity to conform. Sure, I'm looking for that paragraph now. I'm, I'm Sorry, back. the paragraph starts on page 11 2 when talking. of the July 7th meeting minutes on page 11-2. Did I hear that? July 7. Mm -hmm. And then it's the last full paragraph starts okay. off Hi. on page 11-2. Oh. <coughs> there we go. And you would like the word, there was a question on how the amount, were you asking for the word amount to be changed to cost? Yes. Last of my nitpicks, sorry for that minute. Go, go ahead. No, oh, that was the end of the nitpicks. Okay. Very careful reading, Commissioner. Very, very good. Um, okay, so any anyone else have any uh, discussion on the July 7th minutes before we take a, take a vote? <laughs> okay, hearing none. Um, um, how do we do this last time when we when we take do we do we need to do a roll call vote for the minutes? Yes, yes okay. I believe so. So why don't you more can you go ahead and, and then do that? Sure. Um, Commissioner Vanderland. Yeah. Commissioner Lutzis. Yes. Commissioner Baker. Yes. Commissioner Olson. Yes. Commissioner Mulcair. I'll say yes. Was there a motion to approve the minutes and seconded? There was. Okay, yes. Uh, it was motioned by Commissioner Greathouse and seconded by Commissioner Vanderland. Um, Commissioner Ols, oh, just a second. Commissioner Greathouse? Yes. And Commission Chair Orenshaw? Yes. And that um, concludes our roll call vote. Great. Okay, now we'll go to the uh, July 20, uh, 21st uh, Planning Commission minutes. And again, be open to a motion uh, for that. I move we adopt the minutes as presented. I second. second. 
beat you. <laughs> the joys of Zoom. Okay, I believe we have a motion any second uh, to approve the July 21st uh, meeting. I apologize, my screen froze. I don't know if um, okay. there was a request of me. <laughs> um, were good. we ready for a roll call vote then? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Lutzis? Yes. Commissioner Vanderland? Yes. Commissioner Baker? Yes. Commissioner Mulcair? Yes. Commissioner Greathouse? Yes. Chair Orenshaw? Yes. I think you skipped me. Yes, Commissioner Olson. Yeah, it's a yes. Okay, the meeting minutes have been approved for uh, those two meetings. Uh, so the next uh, item on our agenda is the um, uh, Planning Commission memo with the attached uh, policy questions. So I uh, invite the Lori, how are you? Fine, thank you. <laughs> Good. So it's, it's all yours. <laughs> I don't know if Debbie has any remarks or I'll just jump in. <laughs> I, I don't have any remarks. This is um, a new topic for you on your work program tonight. So this is an introduction, but I think the overall goal of this work program item is to develop a review process um, to make it easier to permit affordable housing projects on tax exempt or publicly owned land or for private development, which has an affordable housing component. So that's the goal. And uh, I will now let Laurie dive into the details. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good evening, commissioners. So I'm gonna just go ahead and read you the exact language from the housing strategy plan um, that directed this project to the docket and the planning mission. So the strategy is allow flexible reuse of tax exempt or publicly owned sites through a special process to increase housing supply and enable more diverse forms of housing if linked to providing some affordable housing. Consider possible opportunity at the park and ride. That was an example. So when the, when the city council took up the docket, the 2020 docket at their meeting earlier this year, uh, there were two, um, uh, well, there was a private citizen request. Every year there's an annual one month period when a private citizen can request a change to the comprehensive plan or to the zoning code. And that time period is in uh, November to December of the previous year. So in uh, November of 2019, the city received a private request to consider a, it was actually really a zoning change for a senior housing project that included affordable housing. Uh, the city council determined uh, that they did not want to take up zoning changes at this point. Uh, in a couple of years, we'll be looking at the whole land use element and zoning throughout the city as part of a comprehensive plan update. And so what they suggested was that this um, project be uh, almost like a test case, but a, a way to consider the type of project that might fit in with a private project that might fit in with this affordable housing project. So that too is part of the discussion. Again, there would not be a conference of plan or zoning changes associated uh, with this property, but it is a property that we can discuss when we're thinking of the kind of private uh, property project uh, that might be eligible for this expedited process. So before we brought this forward to the Planning Commission, we took it to the City Council. And we, what we were hoping for was a broad framework, uh, a way for them to let us know early on if there were topics or parts of the process that they were particularly concerned about. Um, and so they had some discussion and ultimately they felt confident that the Planning Commission could uh, develop the process they had two guideposts. 
One was they wanted to be sure that the process included not just uh, affordable housing, perhaps for seniors, but also look at affordable housing for those with disabilities. So that was uh, a motion, a unanimous motion of the council to have you pick up that topic <coughs> as well. And then the other comment they made was that um, they wanted to separate out the discussion of process, an expedited process, from the discussion of perhaps waivers of development standards. They were most focused on expediting this type of a permit. I think that some conversation about um, the types of development standard modifications, if any, uh, would be appropriate. And I think that was uh, envisioned when this housing strategy um, was developed. So that's the background. And so tonight, um, what we hope to do is sort of walk you through the same set of policy questions that we took to the city council uh, so that we can kind of judge the tenor of what you might be interested in uh, before we go away and do our staff work and try to craft a process. So these are broad questions. You're not taking a vote here tonight. Um, it's just a, a sort of a freewheeling discussion about this process. And we have these questions that we think will help guide how the process is approached. Um, but again, this is uh, preliminary and, and we're just looking for a sort of general feedback, general discussion about um, what this kind of a process might look like. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and put up a slide. It's attachment two in your um, materials. And uh, so hopefully I can do this, Mara. I don't know if you have to do something to let me share my screen or whether I can just do it. Um, I believe I will make you the host okay. in order for you to share their screen. Okay. So I will do that now. And you're going to take it back, right? Yes, I will. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't want to be the host of the meeting. No, I will, I will take it back from you when you are ready. All right. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, uh, you all can see this slide. <coughs> Uh, this, is a, this is just a brief summary of the questions that were outlined in more comprehensively in, um, I guess it's on the second page of the memo. So this actually is probably attachment one uh, to your packet. So I'm going to grab a notepad and I am going to take notes. And again, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is just what, does, what do the planning commissioners think about this review process and how we might uh, craft an approach. So the first question is, at what level of affordability should this type of a review process um, be available? So the, you know, there are different categories of affordable housing. There's uh, very low income affordable housing. There's, um, uh, moderate housing, which is up at 80%, and then there's low income housing, which is 30 to 50% of median income. Uh, we don't have to specify that there's a specific level of affordability or what that should be, but it, the question is generally, this is an exception to the typical process that a project would go through. So does the commission have any um, initial reactions to what level of affordability uh, should let this process be available? Well, maybe I'll start. Laura, you mentioned our, it's in the materials about this, the council's um, previous interest in projects at the 50 mm -hmm. to 60% AMI threshold. Is that, right. when you say previously, was that it for another uh, it, type of? Yeah, it, it, it's come up a couple of times about uh, projects and, and that the council was specifically interested in getting uh, low income projects rather than, for example, uh, moderate income, which is up to 80% mm -hmm. of median. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of the range that in other discussions had been um, mentioned. 
it, it would be unusual uh, or difficult for a project uh, for very low income to be um, uh, uh, developed without some sort of a subsidy. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be able to go through the uh, more expedited process, for example. So, Lori, would it be possible for us to see what percentage of uh, affordable housing Kenmore currently has and at, at um, what percentages? Yeah, um, um, I, I have information from, I don't have a slide of it, but I do have information from the comprehensive plan that says uh, it talks about um, the different percentages of the different levels um, uh, percentages of total housing units at the different levels. And then um, when the comprehensive plan was uh, revisited in 2015, the countywide planning policies had set out these percentages for the county as a whole at different levels. So I can just walk you through that. The other commissioners, I just have a lot of questions, and so I don't know how you want to uh, work this, whether you want to gather our questions and then submit a response back for us to consider for our next meeting, or just kind of work through this um, with questions and, and answers during this meeting. I, my personal perspective is we could do both. I happen to have this at my fingertips. I can put it in writing. Uh, for the next agenda, that would probably be useful. Uh, but for now, I can tell you that for very low income housing, less than 30% of median, Kenmore has 3% of their housing units available at that level. And again, this data is not up to the minute, which I probably could get from ARCH, um, but this was in the 2015 comprehensive plan. And the countywide housing need was at 12%. So we have 3%, they were hoping we could aim for 12%. At 30 to 50% of median, which is considered low income, Kenmore has 10% and the countywide housing need was at 12%. Uh, from 50 to 80% of median, which is moderate income, Kenmore has 15% and the countywide housing need was 16%. And then above that, middle income and higher income, I don't think we would consider affordable housing uh, for this um, project. But anyway, you can see that the greatest need at, is at less than 30%, um, followed by 30 to 50%, and then by 50 to 80%, although we're not that far off uh, the countywide targets, um, even at low income and moderate income. Um, Lori, if, if I may, um, so I believe you said that there's the possibility of uh, not even um, specializing this process towards just one category of, of um, affordable housing, but maybe just making um, the expedited process available for all three different categories of mm -hmm. affordable housing. Is that correct? Right. I, I, yeah, I would say that. It, it's it, the commission's going to be the commission's recommendation. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I may make a comment from what you've said, although I, these, um, these statistics, I believe you said are from 2015 and it might be good to get an updated version for the next right. meeting. Um, I don't see why we need to limit this expedited process to just any one or two of these categories. I think it would be, be beneficial and I, I don't see a downside to keeping it open and available for all three of them, especially just based off of these statistics, even though they're older, we're not quite at that threshold um, for the countywide um, kind of goal. Um, so I, that's at least my opinion is keeping this open. Um, and I know that there is definitely a need for affordable housing. And so I, I just don't see why um, we should limit it, this expedited process to just one, one or two of the categories when we can keep it open for all of them to meet our goals and to provide this inventory as well. Okay. 
I agree with that as, as well. Okay. This is my, I have a hard time um, really thinking about the different affordability levels, maybe without a better understanding of the expedited review process itself. Would it be possible and helpful to anyone else to have a conversation about what this expedited review process entails and maybe most specifically what trade-offs or sacrifices we make in the permitting process uh, in exchange for that expedited process? Yeah. Um, I think there's good news and there's bad news. Um, there is no expedited process at this point and, and the charge of the Planning Commission is to develop that process. <laughs> so um, uh, I Can think- Can I ask then why are we diving in? Why are we diving in at deciding at what level it should be applied if we haven't had a conversation yet about what it's going to be? Um, well, you're diving in because what I'm looking for is some very, very broad uh, framework to try to bring something forward to you that you can then chew on, modify, um, weigh, and do all of those things. If I, if I don't have any preliminary guidance, I, I can't really come forward with an idea. So the goal here is to just check in, see if you have a reaction. For example, if you have certain trade-offs that you were not willing to make, it would be nice if I knew those uh, and we could discuss that um, before I, I go too far in trying to figure out how I can help <clears throat> while create this process. Um, com Commissioner Mulcair, I, th I think I understand what you're saying and, and I do want to get a tackle on what this expedited process is, but I understand the importance of going through some of these first questions so we can potentially get a rough draft um, geared more towards, well, at least with this first question, um, you know, say all three types of affordable housing as opposed to just one or two. So um, I, I, I agree with you completely, but I, I understand what Lori's trying to get at some kind of structure to shape a rough draft or maybe some form of an expedited process or to start talking about that, if that yeah. makes any sense. I have yeah. concerns here, which I think may be shared with uh, Mike Mulcair. I have a hard time separating out the policy question of, okay, what should be our target for affordable housing and what category should we emphasize? Separating that out from what are the trade-offs that are going to be or need to be considered within some kind of exception process. If we don't understand, at least have a list of what those potential trade-offs are and an understanding of why that exists in our current code today, I don't think we can make a good value judgment here. When I look at the questions beyond the first one, which I think is, is strictly a, a good policy question, but which I think Nathan and others have already discussed, you get into some economic questions which involve economic trade-offs. And I think you need to have a, I think we need to have a better understanding of what those trade-offs would entail and the impact on the community before we went any further. Um, so I guess specifically, Lori, I was looking for mm -hmm. what are the range of exceptions that would be considered within the process. I believe that's what we're being asked to do is develop a, an exception process. What's the ammunition? You know, what, what's, the, what's the set of exceptions we could deal with? And then having an understanding of why they exist in the code today so we can understand what the trade-off would be if we accepted those. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming that these, we're, we're, we're making the assumption that these exceptions would somehow expedite the process. If, uh, that there's some sort of reporting or there's some sort of other requirement of a developer coming up with a proposal that takes time and effort uh, and maybe cost. We need to understand what the relative uh, weight of those are, as well as what the relative weight of those would be on the community impact. I'll stop there. 
Um, Lori, so um, in your your thought thinking here, um, we've talked about how we probably want to see potentially an expedited pro expedited process, although we haven't discussed what exactly that will look like for the, the three different categories of affordable housing. In your mind, were you thinking that there would be one process to cover all three, or would there be an individual one for each of the three categories? Well, I think, you know, it would, in an ideal world with the zoning code, what we try to do is simplify to make things easy to understand. I certainly could envision maybe a single process, but getting to Mike's point, different criteria or different factors that are weighed um, depending on the level of affordability. I mean, I could envision something like that so that uh, if you're at this level of affordability, you go through the same process, but maybe your criteria are a little bit different or um, uh, maybe the decision maker is different or maybe the appeals process is different um, once you get past uh, the, the main part of the process itself. Does that make sense? Not mm -hmm. really. No, I, I think I understand what you're saying is create sort of a generic outline and then fine tune details for each, right. each one. Right. Um, but the overview would be the same. Now, my right. question for you after that would be, um, what would it take? What would you need from us right now to maybe create your version <laughs> of an expedited plan? We can work out the details later for each one. Right. But looking at the structure, because I agree with com commissioners uh, Mulcair and Vanderland that I think it would be good to see at least um, some sort of structure. We can figure mm -hmm. out the details later, um, mm -hmm. but what would you need from us to make that kind of overarching structure? Yeah, well, I, I think again, uh, what is most helpful to me is to have, a, for example, uh, with the first question, if the planning commission were to decide, you know, this is a special um, expedited process and we only want the very lowest income projects to be able to go through that. We want to limit the number of projects that get to take advantage versus an approach that's um, all, uh, all levels of affordable, affordable housing could be included in this process. Those are two sort of extremes, and those definitely would steer me uh, in a certain direction. Uh, similarly, um, on the next question, what percentage of units in the development should be affordable? If you think about extremes, you could say, well, you know, historically in the TOD, we've always decided that like 10% is the right number. But you could say, Wow, these people are getting a special review process and therefore they shouldn't even be able to go through it unless all their units are affordable or more than half of their units are affordable. I, I, that's the kind of um, very preliminary direction that helps me so that I can craft something that you then you guys can work with and manipulate. Yeah. Lori, this is, yeah, this is a Mark. I, I would agree that um, at least on the first question that with, at least with conceptually that it should be pretty open. I do actually like the kind of the weighted criteria. I mean, it's pretty clear that the, you know, from the stats you have, whether, you know, those may need to be updated, but the, you know, the low income is, is where the need is at least uh, appears to be the greatest. So if there is some, some kind of weighting criteria of however it's structured that could take that into effect, I think I would, um, sort of agree with that. Um, yeah, and so that, that's my thought on the first question. Um. Um, Lori, mm -hmm. if I have a question. So these, these county goals, um, do you know if these are averages and applied evenly across the entire county or is this the, are these numbers specific to Kenmore itself based on the demographics and the economic stature of our city? They're based totally on countywide numbers. Okay. And, and, and in fact, um, the, the uh, county is currently going through a process to look at this whole topic because the question is, um, 
should there be countywide numbers or should it be by region, et cetera? So there is some current discussion going on because we're in the middle of beginning the countywide planning policies update. But mm -hmm. for now, these were countywide numbers and the goal was that overall throughout the county, we would achieve this and each jurisdiction was um, potentially responsible for their share. I mean, that was the goal to strive for. Okay, but I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, we as a city of Kenmore may not need to achieve the 12% of extremely low income housing to meet the right. needs of the, our citizens. Or, or in, and that applies to the other, other categories of affordable housing. I'm just thinking out loud and I'm putting that out there. So mm -hmm. this, this is a little bit more complicated of a topic. Right, it's very complicated. And, and South County, on the other hand, which has a really more significant share of current um, low income housing, uh, would say, we don't think that our communities have any responsibility. Um, that kind of goes uh, against the idea of the Growth Management Act, which is to say that there should be opportunities for all segments of the population to live in any community. That, um, that perspective is, is uh, from the state Growth Management Act. And so, you know, you're walking a fine line here mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, about saying, well, our community doesn't need to have low-income housing because other communities have low-income housing. That is not consistent with the growth management program, which is to say that any person at any income level should be, have an opportunity to live in any community. So it's okay. a shared um, responsibility. So this, this is helping clear some things up um, now. So you want to... Uh, the goal for us, I guess, is to achieve those numbers for the county. Is that correct? Well, I provided those numbers because Suzanne wasn't certain where we were. So that mm -hmm. was just an illustration. Um, mm -hmm. For this particular process, I don't know, you know, if, if I've heard from three commissioners so far that say, well, maybe any kind of affordability, uh, any level of affordability should be able to think about an expedited process because we um, we would value that and we're a little bit short on some of our numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if there are no trade-offs to our standard business practices, our standard permitting processes, um, I think we can be super generous with where it's applied. If, if on the other hand, there are substantial trade-offs, um, then I think maybe it's, it's worth looking at it a little bit more critically and right. saying, well, this really is quite a benefit for developers, quite a even a even a opportunity to do better than they would otherwise financially. Um, in which case, we may want to demand more for our generosity and apply it to a, <clears throat> to a more limited group. Right. So, so maybe our overarching goal <laughs> as we work through these questions would be. The, the council's kind of given us that middle of the road mark as what they want to work with. But I mean, if we open it up to all those different levels, do we want to weight the very most needy group higher or just begin the process and any, any level of affordability is acceptable for this review? special review process? Or do we really want to make it special to a specific group? We've kind of, we've kind of been, so far we've been talking about, well, we should make it available. The special review process should be available for any level of affordability. And maybe we just need to start there. And as we work through the other questions, we're going to see this isn't really going to help us create incentive to meet the needs of what's what's and I, I do think having more current statistics would help us too mm -hmm. I'm sure that, go ahead i was just gonna say i'm sure that arch has uh better numbers so i'll work yeah. it 
getting those. Yeah. And it might be helpful for us to, um, not that we want to have a lot of work for you, Lori. We really need to come up with these guidelines at the best we can. But then I know what I'm going to want to hear later as we, you know, really fine tune them is what are some of the special review processes that are in our surrounding communities doesn't matter their population size, but just what are they? And then for a city that is smaller like us and the amount of land that's actually available to accomplish this kind of affordable housing, how, how do we wait? You know, do we give all of our available building places, land use places that exception and if we're going to do that, what do we want in return in the city? Because, you know, we can look around to the different communities and they may have had a certain special review process five years ago or even seven years ago, but maybe the unintended circumstance or outcomes, they might be in a review process to not do that again. You know, it's hard to imagine because I think any kind of development is better than no development. If there's an affordability component to the developer's plan, I can see why we need to create this review process and get them going because that's why we have the discrepancy now is builders can build. So we have a shortage of housing and it's not just it's not just the affordability factor, but the shortage of housing contributes to the lack of affordability because it drives the prices up, but I'm jumping ahead. But I do think I, I'm in agreement when I'm listening to this beginning launch that we should open it up to all those levels. And as we work through our criteria to come up with these guidelines, we may go back and narrow that scope. But for now, it's a beginning framework. Or, or at least um, we can keep it open, but maybe make it more um, lenient for the, the categories that we feel are more important, kind of adjust it to meet those needs, but still keep it open. Because like you said, we understand um, that, well, from the statistics we were given that we're lacking in each of the areas. Um, but I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> One thing I'd like to also understand is what is the true value of an expedited process to the developer? Economically, how much of an incentive is this? Um, it, um, it was my understanding that actually it is quite an incentive. Um, not, and not in the sense of we're creating the special process as as an incentive more of we have people who want to do this and they're trapped in a system that takes so long that they can't it, it doesn't you know time is money and it it makes it just that much more difficult so i i'm not sure that um the real the real purpose of this strategy was to incentivize affordable housing rather to have the opportunity if someone comes in with a project that this is a, a like a bonus for them so it's slightly different not quite created as an incentive but as um, for example we've had propo different proposals um, that maybe they want to do an affordable housing component but it, the the process is is so arduous or takes enough time that they're uncomfortable with it. So we're trying to make it easy, uh, again, with the idea that time is money. Well, if I understand what you've just told us, Lori, uh, mm -hmm. the goal here is to create a process that would reduce the lag time uh, between a project <coughs> being proposed and it actually coming online. And our right. hope is that if we reduce that lag time, we'll have uh, more affordable housing uh, come online Maybe not more affordable housing, but we could have some would come, come on sooner. Right, right. 
but what I think we would need to then understand is what is still going to be in or what would be excluded from what would be part of that review process today. You know, what are the hard stops? I, I'm sure we don't want to encourage developers to propose, let alone begin, projects that weren't economically viable. And I think that maybe gets into some of our later discussions about what percentage of units, what level. Um, mm -hmm. We need to understand that trade-offs. I and mean, we went to 10% in our early affordable housing because yeah. we looked through a, basically a set of simultaneous equations here that said, if you're going to have this level of affordability in order to be financially viable, you, you needed to have this, uh, this level of affordable housing within a property that would eventually be this size that you would, that goes along. You've got something that also plays with that, which is what's the, what's the cost of that? I, mm -hmm. I think there are hard stops in there that we'd have to understand that that is or isn't something that's on the table, so we could understand what is, so we could understand what would actually create that expedited process that would reduce that lag time. So I think yeah. having an understanding of what those things are now, particularly developers are complaining about, that saying, I can't get my, I won't, I don't feel like I'm going to bring a project forward because it's going to take so long to do the review. Here's the part of the review that takes so long. So we'd understand what are the places where we could propose meaningful productive changes versus those that are hard stop and say, no, no, we wouldn't have a viable project out here or be risking uh, the viability of a project if we didn't understand this before it was. Mm -hmm. um, Lori, so currently there is a process um, when creating affordable housing, right? But we're just trying to make potentially um, an expedited option for that process. Correct. Would it be possible to see what the process as it is right now, um, see what that it, is? Yeah, there's not a specific process related okay. to affordable housing. So for example, um, at the park and ride, uh, where there was discussion of putting in place uh, an af affordable housing component, um, you look to the zoning and then you decide whether, well, is it a, um, is it a building permit? Is it a higher level of review because of the use itself? Um, it's very site specific about what the process might be. So, so the goal, I think, of this project is to say, we don't want to have to do this time after time after time. Instead, let's talk about a process. And again, maybe um, looking to different levels of affordability for using the process for projects that meet the criteria that we identify, they could more quickly go through than they would through the normal zoning. But if, they're, if we're not comfortable, they always have the option to go through the regular process on their pro property. <coughs> so would that- Can get a would, copy of the regular zoning process? Well, it, again, it depends on the site. It depends on the zoning and it depends on the use uh, that's going. So there's not a single process I could provide. I can tell you that there are four levels of processes currently in the zoning code. Um, the easiest one is a decision that's made by the Director of Development Services. And building permits fall in that process. Um, other types of simple permits. Then it goes to a process where uh, there's an appeal to the hearing examiner, then there's a hearing examiner pr process where you go before the hearing examiner to make your case. Um, then there are other processes that take you all the way to the city council to make the final decision. So there, there are different levels and there are lots of different kinds of permits. And I can certainly provide that table, um, but to say on a particular piece of property what the process would be would be a site specific analysis. So I'll Also, do you have any historical data on what the sticking points are in the process for large development projects like we're talking about apartment buildings or things like that? What, what's, the, um, 
what's causing the most grief for people? Yeah, I, I don't have a good handle on that. I need to talk with Arch, who's done most of the work with our affordable housing projects, but I certainly can talk with them and they'll also have information from other um, communities about the problems that they face, that what are the time problems? And, and this again is just the time component. We haven't even touched on whether there's a development standard component. True. Lori, I had a question about um, the council uh, expressed an interest in um, making sure we have housing for people with disabilities. How, how does that factor into what we talked about in terms of the income um, levels in, in terms of what might be available for a special process? Yeah, I, it also relates to the third question. Believe it or not, we're kind of answering these questions, <laughs> just not all in, <laughs> in the order on the slide. Um, so you'll see the third question is, should senior housing projects be eligible regardless of level of affordability? Mm -hmm. It's the same mm -hmm. question uh, for um, people with disabilities. Should projects <clears throat> designed to house those with disabilities be eligible for this quicker process regardless of affordability? Um, mm -hmm. Seniors, uh, for example, in the Federal Community Development Block Grant Program, senior projects are always considered affordable projects, regardless of the income of the folks who live there. Because mm -hmm. I think the assumption is that they're on a fixed income um, and, and they just don't bother to go any deeper than that. They just say, if you're a senior project, you're an affordable housing project. Uh, you could do something similar for those with disabilities. Um, so that's uh, a question, you know, do we really want to get into testing level of affordability for certain categories? Or do we just want to make sort of a blanket statement that housing for this uh, group is always eligible, regardless of affordability? Huh. Just a quick statement on, on that point. Uh, one of the things I'd want to understand is when we're talking about uh, disability uh, projects to enable dis uh, disabled folks and seniors uh, to have access, would we want to have as part of the criteria for the exception process that the developer explain to us what accommodations they're going to be making in their design that would facilitate uh, safe and reasonable care for a senior and or for a disabled person. I have a feeling this leaving it open-ended, anybody over the age of 65 or disabled as defined and that may not really get us the type of housing mm -hmm. uh, that's really contemplated. Okay. What's, what's the point there, Mike, is that uh, we shouldn't necessarily be considering overlap between senior and affordability that their, their distinction should be treated no I, I think there is a good point mike i think there probably definitely would be overlap so many particularly older seniors have chronic illness and they may could be disabled but we'd want to understand if if a developer is proposing a project and asking for an exception on the basis of uh, senior living and or disabled or both that that is included in their proposal and that's part of the evaluation process. So we're ensuring that we're actually getting those public goods and not just. Uh, okay. Lori, I have a question. Do we know, and this may have been asked and answered, I apologize if I missed it, but um, are the developers looking to, would the benefit here to developers be uh, quicker time to value, meaning they can get their, their units built and sold more quickly, or a lower cost development project, especially up front in the permitting process, or both? I think, you know, the original intent of the strategy, and, and you'll have to remember that the initial idea here was not that this was being developed for private developers, or 
it could be private developers, but they were developing on public property or nonprofit property. So it wasn't supposed to be, um, you have a developer who owns a private piece of property and now for their, because they're gonna do affordable housing, they get an expedited process. That was brought in with the inclusion of this senior housing consideration by a private person. But the initial impetus was to say, if you have a project that's going on a uh, piece of property owned by a nonprofit or a public property like the park and ride, how can we make that happen more quickly? It, it's not quite the same. It, it gets kind of back to that earlier discussion with, is this an incentive or is this support <clears throat> for a project that's going on a piece of special property. Did that answer your question? Not really? Yeah, I did. The, the very yeah. last thing that you mentioned there, the support versus incentive piece does make sense to me. This reminds me of a situation that occurred many, many years ago in the state of New Jersey when they passed the um, casino gambling legislation a certain percentage of those profits were uh, legislated to go towards senior housing communities with an expedite, I believe, with an expedited process and relaxed requirements. Unfortunately, the result was many of those buildings fell down, uh, putting seniors at risk. Oh. The very incentives they put in place to uh, generate the supply uh, ended up becoming uh, disastrous. So mm -hmm. just uh, uh, as I'll look for a reference from that. It was <laughs> in the 1970s, but just something to keep a, an eye on that mm -hmm. uh, in many cases, the process, the lengthy and time consuming processes are there and for a reason, which might be to, pr to protect public safety or, or mm -hmm. uh, t tenant safety. And we'll have to make sure we don't make the mistakes that were made in Atlantic <clears throat> City. 40, 40 years ago. Great example, Mike. Uh, and I think you can look at a lot of the uh, public housing policies that were uh, projects that were put up in, in major cities during the 60s and 70s. So that by the time you got to the 80s and 90s, uh, those were just substandard. And uh, mm -hmm. some of them were even dangerous. Uh, but they were built because they were given expedited approval. And mm -hmm. a lot of the standard uh, review processes that would have assured proper housing uh, and public investment uh, were uh, were waived. So I think we have to understand what that is, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't waive the wrong thing. Yes, we want to help uh, improve, perhaps <coughs> expedite the amount of uh, affordable housing, but we want to have viable housing, but that's both viable in terms of its long-term financial viability, but also that it's decent housing. Right. Uh, it's not so yeah. standard. So there's got to be yeah. some rules in here. We just can't regularly approve everything. So uh, when I... uh, just one question, then I'll shut up. Uh, I'm assuming that the special property uh, is geared uh, because these are all non uh, non tax properties that part of the intent here is to preserve the city's tax base. That's why we're not looking at private property, privately owned property, we're looking at a government owned property uh, or other uh, tax exempt properties? Yeah, I, I don't think the question of tax base was ever part of it. Mm -hmm. I think the idea was that often um, affordable housing proponents, if they, for example, they pick up a piece of surplus public property or you have a church that once has excess uh, property on uh, their lot and they would like to do some affordable housing. Um, the idea really was, how can we make it easier for them? It was not, how can we increase the city's tax base? It, it, are there inherent efficiencies or ease, or ease of process related to these special types of properties? So that they don't require as much review, or there is a no. lower standard. No, it's the same. Not currently. Mm -mm. Thank you. No. Okay. Well, um, any other thoughts about um, maybe we j just could look at um, 
I, I sense a, uh, some discomfort in even trying to figure out what percentage should be affordable until we have a better sense of what a process might look like. And it's possible that this next question, what size of project should be able to take advantage of the process might be similar. Again, I was looking if you had initial thoughts about extremes, like if it's fewer than 10 units, we don't want to go there. Um, it, it's either it or a minimum of 75 units before you get the special process. You know, any reactions to small, large, um, and if not, I think because there's such a need for housing, I realize to be expedited and we make this about affordable housing, <coughs> that we might look at a smaller project and just say, hey, that's not worth expediting. But I think every unit of affordable housing that we can create, and again, Kenmore's gonna be limited in our actual footprint of doing this, um, I don't think it should be limited to how many units it is. If you had a 10 unit building and let's say we make our percentage 20%, that's two units of affordable housing. We could even make it, you know, 50%, um, who knows? We're not at that place yet, but I think the project size needs to be filtered through the fact that there is a great need and most of these properties that we might have available, I'm just thinking out loud, would be near the DOT or the TOD. And I don't think we should limit it to size. I think big and small, let's build them. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, Carol on that, on that point conceptually. Yeah, we're certainly trying to create more affordable housing and the more you know, inclusive we are, the more we advance towards that goal. I wonder if there might be, again, some sort of weighting like we talked about with level of affordability that could be considered for that particular point. I, don't, I don't, obviously don't have any you know, numbers or percentages to, to throw out, but um, mm -hmm. certainly would, you know, I, I would favor that, that sort of idea of being inclusive um, uh, in, the, in terms of the project, um, yeah, size. And, and there's obviously different calculuses for developers, you know, if they're building a five unit uh, development versus a 50 unit and how many affordable units, you know, make, make sense for, for them. So I, yeah, don't have any specifics on that, but yeah, that's, that's the concept I'm, I think, leaning, leaning towards at this point. <laughs> um, I, I completely understand what you're saying and, and I see your point there too. And I'm not saying I'm against it all, but one of the issues I could see happening, I, I don't think it will because Kenmore is such a small city, but this expedited process um, becoming kind of gummed up with uh, lots of smaller projects. When I think what it's geared towards is, is housing projects. So a little bit larger of projects. Um, and what I'm thinking here is maybe somebody's just, this is an extreme example, but maybe just a two unit project and maybe one or both of them are, are both affordable. That would be 50 or 100%. So they certainly qualify for this expedited process, but it's again, so small and neg negligible that it, it, I don't know if it would be worth it and if it's taking away from what we were tasked with. Again, I'd like to clarify that I'm not against what you're saying and I completely you know, agree that uh, any affordable housing we can get matters, but uh, that's just one issue that I could see in, in the extreme, extreme kind of scenario coming up. I would agree we need to look at all of the potential options. On the end of small uh, units, I worry about financial viability. Uh, can a two unit, I would assume from the information we've looked at in the past about affordability, when you get into small numbers of units, the financial viability, uh, but the potential for failure goes up. Uh, I'd also like if we want to look at smaller projects, we uh, ask ourselves to what extent has this been addressed through the new or soon to be revised ADU processes, which have already uh, relaxed and created the separate standards uh, that are intended to allow a quicker or minimal review.
Lori, I, I um, wonder if for kind of putting that stake in the ground around affordability level and maybe even number of units, is there some work that we can leverage from our density conversations of last year where we, we, we seem to have a really similar kind of conversation, but I think there we had a, a lot more of the variables defined in terms of what we were trading off, right? We knew we were trading off increased density for affordable units. And for that conversation, with the help of Arch, we identified a particular affordability level based on median income. Can, I was pretty comfortable with how that conversation went. Would it, could, could we leverage or borrow, even as a starting point, any of those decisions that we made to get the ball rolling here? All right. Um... Are you thinking of the the up? I'm not quite sure which project you're thinking of. Whether you were thinking of the upzoning of the manufactured housing communities, or no, I, I it was a it, it may have been related to the neighborhood business units, but we we had a pretty lengthy conversation about density incentives and increases for developers in exchange for affordable housing unit set asides because that's how mm -hmm. and you're right it was connected to the it really started with a what will we put in place of what requirements will we put on developers who de who choose to develop it within an existing affordable mobile uh, manufactured home community so that was the origin of the conversation but i thought we we had gone through with with um arch's help kind of understanding at what affordability level we should be targeting. I, I wanna say we landed at the 35% number, but I could be wrong, it may have been high as 50. Um, but I thought as a starting point, since that felt to be a well talked through uh, dialogue that we had to get to those numbers. Okay. Uh, maybe that could be our starting point as well. Am I, fellow commissioners, is, is this sounding familiar to you, the conversation we had around density versus affordability. Yeah, there definitely, there de yeah, there definitely is a correlation between how many units you can put on a given piece of property to make it viable. And I think what we were talking about back then was increasing density to make those locations, which mostly were private locations, <coughs> uh, be <coughs> kind of incentivized the development to actually happen. Mm -hmm. I think we're, if we're really looking at, you know, county owned properties or nonprofit properties where there could be development, um, I, I mean, we're not totally excluding privately owned land, are we? Um, it, it was, this or, is a hard or, question to answer because the, the request yeah. that came in was a senior housing project on privately right. owned land. Right. Now, the, the council in that conversation was talking about senior housing and senior affordable housing. So it was not broadened necessarily to include every piece of private property in the city. I, I don't think um that that's what uh was under discussion if the planning commission felt that that was something that um was appropriate that this process should be available to whoever can meet the requirements i don't know that that would be a bad thing i have some concerns about that if we're going to open this up to be basically anywhere in the city including private uh, I'm concerned that we begin to unwind the zoning work we did uh, earlier on, in particularly the work in determining where we wanted to have that we wanted to build that density, including the TOD, as yeah. well as the city's long term strategic plan, which is assuming that that density is going to benefit the city in terms of its uh, the financial viability of uh, the city budget. Uh, I think if you expand this to include any uh, or private in general, you're going to begin to unwind that work. We need to understand better what the impact is. Yeah, I, I, ju I just want to clarify, we're talking about, again, the, in fact, this is the distinction the council made. We're talking about an expedited process versus a change to development standards. 
Um, so for example, if you had a project that was being proposed on a private property that met the criteria for the affordable housing um, that you all established, the, looking at the trade-offs, is there any reason that that should not go through an expedited process, which is a different question from saying they should be allowed more density? That's a totally different question. Um, so I think you're talking about um, changing the, uh, the, like the zoning requirements for density. Uh, and, and what we're starting with here is looking at a process for a project that meets all of the development standards, but is just an affordable housing project. You know, we can look at those other things, but the, the main point was, and, and I think the council emphasized, they were more interested in the process than in waiving development standards. So what I'm hearing you say is that this expedited process really is geared more towards, although we don't want to say it this way, but a specific type of development where it, it's in the density of the transportation overlay, but what we're really after is expediting that kind of a properties around the county where the cities may it may or may not have, but it really was an affordable housing it's meeting that goal. And so they worked with the county. I'm thinking of the one that's right down in Houghton and Kirkland. It's a beautiful result. But it'd be interesting to go back in their uh, history of how they were able to make that partnership work. Did they need this kind of expedited process? And then the question I always have going through my mind is, well, if these county properties can apply for these affordability criteria, why can't a private developer on a private piece of property also receive that same special review process? That's where I think it gets tricky. I, yeah, I think it, it I seems think that's like what Mike was saying. That yeah, it, but, I, but I think- You know, should it or shouldn't it? I think it's better if we just flat out state that that this expedited process really is meant for public or nonprofit properties to be developed with affordability in mind. You know, because why should you have an expedited process if it doesn't have that? And again, I'm thinking about the pieces of property that are around the city that are not developed that potentially could be. Um, it could change the dynamic of how a developer views that land, even if it is private property. So to the extent that this process doesn't uh, change any of the zoning or other requirements, that what we're doing is trying to come up with a process that would expedite the review that would happen otherwise, and that review doesn't change, uh, then I don't have the concerns about unwinding all of the work that's already been done. Yeah, if those zoning, if that if that zoning isn't what the review process is about, it all it really is is giving projects a chance. You know, and we're kind of moving into a very unknown economic period but it's also could be a wonderful opportunity with the way interest rates are lower. If we had some kind of process that expedited these types of projects, maybe we'd actually see something happen. I would suggest there's two policy questions we need to resolve. Uh, one is, is the process available only to those projects uh, proposed for city-owned or other non, uh, 
non-private properties, a tax exempt properties or not. Uh, will we expand it? Are we thinking of this process would be available to others? And then is part of that uh, expedited process intended to eliminate or relax uh, the requirements, zoning requirements and other for that, uh, that project would otherwise uh, have to uh, have to be. And I think if the answer to those two questions leads into a whole bunch of other, but it helps direct and narrow down what the analysis that we have to make is. Okay. Um, other comments, or we can just talk about the last two, uh, and and these all will. Uh, go back to the two uh, questions that Mike has raised, which are, are critical questions. What properties would this process apply to? And again, the difference between an expedited process and the ability to waive development standards. Um, the last two questions had to do with the process itself and who should make the decision what level of decision making is appropriate. And then the corollary to that is should you be able to appeal a project. Um, <coughs> I think the the questions, Mike's two questions are critical <laughs> to even begin to answer these uh, two. Uh, so I don't know if the commission has any initial reaction to the two questions Mike posed. I mean, should the, what the city council was thinking about was using it on public and nonprofit properties with an expansion to consider projects on private properties for senior housing and housing for those with disabilities. That's where they were. And so, but they didn't really talk about anything else. And so the planning commission ultimately could decide whether it should be expanded to include affordable housing projects on private property. Any reactions? Okay. That, go ahead. Go ahead, I think. Oh, sorry. I guess no. my first initial reaction to this, uh, well, I'm just saying initial because, you know, I'm still going to think about this more and I, I assume that it'll most likely change as I hear more opinions, but hearing these two policy questions about public and government, um, either with or without private property and the change or to, or the exemption for the zoning or whatever, I think those are the two policy questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, the first thought in my mind was kind of one or the other almost. So you could have private, include private properties, but keep the zoning in place and don't allow exemptions for zoning or keep it to public and government property and then maybe allow an exception to zoning. That was my initial kind of thought, but mm. again, it's, it, 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 it could change as I hear more ideas and opinions coming out and really explore this further. Laurie, on your last question, should limitations on project appeals be considered? Do we have any precedent for that in the permitting process today? Um, well, tip, uh, probably at the city council level. So I'm trying to think, and maybe Debbie can jump in here because I don't have it right at the tip of my tongue, but you don't always have to have an administrative level appeal a person can always appeal to court. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you can have one administrative appeal. So for example, building permits are a type one process and there is no appeal process except to a state uh, board. It's not, there's no administrative appeal. Um, I'm trying to think of some of those other permits. 
Often there is an appeal to the hearing examiner for those lower level permits. Um, with the hearing examiner, uh, sometimes there's an appeal to city council. Other times I don't think you can appeal to the city council. And council, um, council decisions obviously just go straight to court. Okay. So what I can do, I, I'm and going to provide that. Behind. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. So this, the question is phrased as a limitation on project appeals, which seems a little counterintuitive to me if we're looking for ways to incent affordable housing on public land how does how does limiting someone's appeal rights fit into that conversation um, it fits in because an, an administrative appeal uh, take ex, extends a project so for example if you get your approval at by whoever made the decision and then that decision can be appealed to another wow city of Kenmore person or group. Uh, and then okay. that decision could be appealed to court. You can see how it would extend out the project. Yeah, I was thinking of, that's a good, I was thinking of it from the developer's perspective. They would not want any limitation on appeals, but for any, any other party, mm -hmm. then that would give them a little bit of a cushion of, um, when, when I send out the uh, list of the different existing processes, I'm going to, that describes where the appeal goes. So that will be helpful. That will provide that information to you. Lori, it might also be worth knowing of the existing appeal processes that are out there, uh, which of those, if any, are band-aided in state or federal regulation. So we, we don't have the choice of uh, of cutting those out, but um, I'm not sure which ones we could. I'm not sure there are any, Mike, that are mandated by the state. Okay. I think uh, you could always eliminate administrative appeals, but I will double check that. Okay. So the the process today is governed under uh, city rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. And by putting limitations on the appeals process for others for, for for parties other than developer that's burdening let's say it's a, a neighborhood community association or uh, some other party the burdens being the, the, a burden is being placed on them when they don't really have any opportunity to benefit right so it's it, it's a benefit to the developer but it's a mm -hmm. burden to whoever is giving up that appellate right right well, they, they without, would never without totally that having, give up their right, but but it makes it much harder. Right, but the, the cost the cost of going to district court versus right. attending a an, a, a, a hearing in, in uh, Kenmore is quite different. Mm -hmm. I think the. Uh, decision on that one probably would need to be considered along with uh, your next to the last, who is the decision maker? If we're going to, going to impinge upon, let's say, community's ability to be able to appeal a decision, I think that decision needs to be made by an elected official or an elected body. Or at least I throw that out for discussion. When you see the table of the processes, you'll see that the kind of things that go to the council for decision are very complex kinds of things. Um, and things like uh, whether it's a building permit or a short plat or a long plat or a site plan um, are not made by the legislative body. And part of that reason is, is um, Oftentimes when you get an administrative process, there's sort of a, a guarantee of going through that without sort of perhaps a level of politics being in, involved in it. The other thing I might point out is that the higher the level of decision maker, the longer the process takes. 
And that is because, for example, if something goes to the hearing examiner, you have to um, have uh, work it into the hearing examiner's schedule. Uh, if it goes to the city council, they meet only certain times a month. It, it just, uh, versus if you're doing more of an administrative type of an approval, it, it goes to one person, it's all done at the staff level, and so it's, it's faster. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm just pointing out the time difference. I understand, so really what sounds, what we've got is a trade-off between uh, administrative simplicity and time and a potential reduction in the uh, community member's ability to be able to uh, have input or influence the final decision. -making. That's correct. And that's the trade-off we have to we have to work with and live with. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, any additional comments? I've I've heard uh, what initial pieces of information you need to help with the discussion, <coughs> and uh, I can begin to flesh out some options. Um, for processes that you could consider. And we can sort of move it to the next step about whether you like this version versus this version versus this version. Okay. So do you need anything else from us then tonight, Lori? I do not. Great, okay. Well, I think that uh, covers our agenda that we had for tonight. So is there any other business for us uh, tonight from the staff or fellow commissioners? No? <laughs> okay. Okay, hearing none, we are adjourned and we'll meet, uh, see you in all in a couple, couple of weeks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank Good evening. You.